In today's top stories, the chief of staff of Saudi Arabia's armed forces is set to hold talks in Iran, signaling a potential shift in regional dynamics. In Yemen, the Saudi-led coalition reports the deaths of two of its forces in ongoing operations. A Palestinian hospital official confirms 17 deaths in an Israeli airstrike on northern Gaza. Israel intensifies its attacks on both Gaza and Hezbollah targets in Lebanon. Lithuania's government faces controversy by including a party led by an individual currently on trial for anti-Semitism. A prominent activist speaks out after Iran allegedly attempted to kill her and former President Trump, vowing to survive to witness the regime's downfall. Republicans are on the verge of securing control of the U.S. House of Representatives after taking the Senate. Nikki Haley responds to Trump's claim that she won't be part of his future cabinet, wishing him great success. A GOP congressman-elect reveals an ambitious 100-day plan for a potential Trump administration. Special counsel Jack Smith moves to dismiss the election interference case against Trump. The EU reaffirms its unwavering support for Ukraine following a potential Trump victory. Russia is becoming more aggressive on British soil warns the UK's defense chief. Russian officials express openness to considering Trump's proposals for ending the war in Ukraine. Drones strike Moscow as a top UK official highlights the growing Russian casualties in Ukraine. In a fresh move in the South China Sea, China has delimited a contested shoal amid tensions with the Philippines. Stay with us as we explore these developments and their global impact. Saudi Arabia's armed forces chief of staff, Fayyad al-Ruwaili is set to visit Tehran on Sunday to meet with Iran's military leaders, marking a significant step in defense dialogue between the two regional powers. Al-Ruwaili, leading a high-ranking Saudi delegation, will discuss defense and bilateral cooperation with his Iranian counterpart, Major General Mohammad Bagheri. This development follows last year's call between Bagheri and Saudi Defense Minister Prince Khalid bin Salman, aimed at strengthening regional security ties. The talks are also notable as they come after Donald Trump's re-election, with his administration's past focus on the Abraham Accords to normalize relations between Arab nations and Israel. Although Saudi Arabia hasn't formalized ties with Israel, discussions have taken place, reportedly involving Trump's advisor Jared Kushner and Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Saudi-Iranian relations were re-established in March 2023, mediated by China after seven years of tension that had fueled conflicts across the Middle East. This visit signifies a push towards stability in the Gulf as both nations work to ease long-standing hostilities. Two members of the Saudi-led coalition in Yemen were killed on Friday in an attack carried out by an employee of Yemen's defense ministry at a training camp in Seyun, located in Hadramaut province. Coalition spokesperson Turki al-Malki confirmed the attack, which also injured one officer according to Saudi state media. The coalition, along with Yemeni authorities, has launched an investigation to uncover the motive behind this incident and ensure the assailant faces justice. The Saudi-led coalition has been involved in Yemen since 2015, supporting the government after Iran-aligned Houthi forces seized control of the capital, Sana'a. However, Yemen has seen nearly two years of reduced hostilities as peace talks between Saudi and Houthi officials continue, offering a fragile period of calm in the region. An Israeli airstrike on a home sheltering displaced people in Gaza's Jabalia refugee camp has reportedly killed at least 17 people, including nine women, according to Dr. Fadel Naim, director of Gaza City's al Ahli Hospital. Rescue efforts are ongoing, and the death toll may rise. Israel's military stated that it targeted a location used by militants but did not provide specific evidence, noting that the details of the strike are under review. In a separate incident, Lebanon's health ministry reported that an Israeli airstrike killed at least 20 people in the village of Almat, north of Beirut, far from Hezbollah's typical strongholds. This recent violence comes as northern Gaza experiences worsening conditions, with experts warning of imminent famine. Humanitarian aid remains severely limited, and the Biden administration has urged Israel to increase assistance or potentially face U.S. funding restrictions. Meanwhile, Israel's ground invasion, initiated after Hamas' attack on October 7, has left much of Gaza devastated, with widespread displacement affecting nearly 90% of the 2.3 million residents. 
Ceasefire talks, mediated by the U.S., Qatar, and Egypt, remain stalled. Qatar, a mediator with Hamas, recently announced a suspension of its efforts, citing the need for all parties to demonstrate a commitment to ending the conflict. Israel has intensified its military operations in both the Gaza Strip and southern Lebanon, with the Israeli military announcing it has eliminated dozens of terrorists. In Gaza's Jabalia area, Israeli forces reportedly dismantled multiple militant infrastructure sites and destroyed a weapons storage facility. Operations have also extended to Beit Lahia in northern Gaza and Rafah in the south, where the military says it is conducting targeted operations based on intelligence. In Lebanon, the Israeli Air Force claims to have eliminated dozens of Hezbollah fighters over recent days, focusing on weapon storage sites and launch facilities. These escalated strikes reflect Israel's ongoing efforts to target militant groups across the region, in line with its intensified military strategy. Lithuania's Social Democrats, the winners of last month's election, have defended their decision to form a coalition government with the populist Nemunas Dawn Party, whose leader, Remigius Zemaitaitis, is currently on trial for alleged anti-Semitic remarks. Zemaitaitis, who resigned from parliament in April to avoid impeachment, faces charges of inciting hatred and downplaying the Holocaust due to social media posts last year. He denies any wrongdoing. Though Zemaitaitis will not hold a cabinet position, his party will oversee three of the 14 ministries, including the Justice Ministry. Social Democrat Deputy Leader and incoming Prime Minister Gintautas Palukas stated that this coalition was necessary to ensure government stability, while assuring international allies that neither his party nor the coalition tolerates anti-Semitism. However, international concerns have emerged. U.S. Senator Ben Cardin and German parliamentarian Michael Roth have criticized the coalition, arguing that it compromises democratic values. Despite this, the coalition has secured a majority with 84 seats in Lithuania's 141-seat parliament. The new government is set to take office in December. Iranian-American activist Masi Alinejad, who was recently targeted in an assassination plot orchestrated by the Iranian regime, spoke out after learning that two men had been arrested in connection to the attempt on her life. Alinejad, who was set to give a talk at Fairfield University, revealed that the same group was also allegedly tasked with assassinating former President Donald Trump. The plot also involved surveillance near her Brooklyn home. In a post on X, Alinejad expressed her shock and emphasized her commitment to continue her activism, despite the regime's deadly attempts to silence her. The FBI alerted her to the threat, and while the Biden administration offered her witness protection, she rejected it, insisting that she would not be silenced. She voiced her frustration with President Trump's statements about potentially negotiating with Iran, highlighting that assassination is ingrained in the regime's tactics. Alinejad, who fled Iran to exercise her freedom of speech in the U.S., also expressed her support for Trump's decision to eliminate Qasem Soleimani. Alinejad, a vocal critic of the Iranian government, asserted that the regime wants her dead because of her stance against tyranny. She declared, I want to fight against this regime, and I want to be alive to see the end of this regime, reiterating her determination to remain active in the fight for human rights. Republicans are close to securing control of the U.S. House of Representatives after the November 5th general election, a crucial win that would help President-elect Donald Trump push his agenda when he assumes office in January. As of Saturday, Republicans had won 213 of the 435 House seats, with projections indicating that Representative Dan Newhouse would retain control of Colorado's 3rd Congressional District for the GOP. Republicans need just five more seats to maintain House control, having already wrested control of the Senate from Democrats. The race is still tight, with Democrats holding 205 seats and needing to win 13 of the remaining 17 contested races to regain control. Securing the House, alongside Trump's presidential victory and a Republican-controlled Senate, would grant the GOP significant power to advance a broad agenda that includes tax and spending cuts, deregulation of the energy sector, and tighter border security. In Senate leadership news, Republicans are set to choose their leader for 2025. Senators John Thune, John Cornyn, and Rick Scott are vying for the position, with Senators Bill Hagerty and Rand Paul endorsing Scott. 
Cornyn has promised that if he wins the leadership role, he will keep the Senate in session until Trump's cabinet is confirmed. Nikki Haley responded graciously after President-elect Donald Trump announced that she would not be joining his new cabinet, despite speculation surrounding potential cabinet members. In a post on X, Haley, who had run against Trump in the Republican primaries, expressed her well wishes for his success. I was proud to work with President Trump defending America at the United Nations, she wrote, adding, I wish him and all who serve great success in moving us forward to a stronger, safer America over the next four years. This response came after Trump publicly announced on Truth Social that neither Haley, the former UN ambassador, nor former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo would be part of his administration. Trump stated, I will not be inviting former Ambassador Nikki Haley or former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo to join the Trump administration, which is currently in formation. He added that he appreciated their past service and wished them well. Haley had distanced herself from Trump during her campaign, though she later penned an op-ed in support of him, writing that while she didn't agree with him 100% of the time, she felt he was the better choice compared to Vice President Kamala Harris. Arizona Republican Congressman-elect Abe Hamade shared his ambitious plan for the first 100 days of a Republican-controlled Congress and White House in an interview with Fox News Digital. He emphasized a swift and bold agenda, saying that Speaker Mike Johnson and the Republican leadership team have already been preparing for this moment. Key priorities for Hamade include Border security. He plans to make border security measures permanent. Election integrity. He stressed the importance of secure elections for preserving the republic. Energy independence. Increasing energy independence to reduce inflation and boost economic growth. Hamaday expressed confidence that Republicans are better prepared to advance Trump's agenda in 2025 than they were in 2017. He also expressed skepticism about Democrats, saying that despite their rhetoric of cooperation, they will likely continue their efforts to undermine Trump's presidency, as seen during his first term with impeachment inquiries and media campaigns against him. He further noted that Trump has a historic mandate from both the popular vote and the Electoral College, making his presidency and the Republican agenda a clear directive from the American people. Hamada added that Trump's one-term presidency could be a liberating factor, enabling him to focus on delivering his policies without re-election concerns. As the new Congress takes shape, Hamade remains committed to ensuring that the America First agenda is prioritized. Despite a narrow loss expected by Democrats, Hamade is confident Republicans will hold the majority in the House. Special Counsel Jack Smith has filed a motion to vacate all deadlines in the 2020 election interference case against President-elect Trump, signaling that the case may be moving toward a possible dismissal. This move aligns with long-standing Department of Justice policy, which generally avoids bringing criminal charges against a sitting president. While the case is not officially dropped, Smith plans to provide an update on its status by December 2. The development offers Trump a potential relief, as he has previously vowed to fire Smith if re-elected, citing his legal battles stemming from the aftermath of the 2020 election. Smith, appointed by Attorney General Merrick Garland in 2022, had been investigating Trump's alleged attempts to overturn the election results and his handling of classified documents after leaving the White House. The Department of Justice is reportedly winding down these federal cases, in line with an Office of Legal Counsel memo advising against prosecuting a sitting president. Although Trump still faces state-level charges in Georgia and New York, former Attorney General Bill Barr has urged local prosecutors to move on, calling continued proceedings a spectacle that distracts from the nation's priorities. A decision in the New York case is expected soon regarding whether the state will pursue felony charges against Trump in the final months before his potential second term. EU foreign policy chief Josep Borrell visited Kiev on Saturday to reaffirm the European Union's unwavering support for Ukraine following Donald Trump's victory in the U.S. presidential election. Borrell emphasized that European support remains crucial for Ukraine to continue defending itself against Russia's invasion. 
His visit aimed to reassure Kiev, which has expressed concerns about Trump potentially reducing U.S. military and financial aid to Ukraine. Trump has previously suggested he might end large-scale U.S. support and even seek a quick deal to end the war. Burrell acknowledged the uncertainty surrounding the incoming U.S. administration, noting that President Biden still has two months in office to make decisions. He stressed the need for more military support, faster supplies, and training for Ukraine, along with permission to strike Russian military targets on Russian soil. As Ukraine's forces struggle on the battlefield, with Russian advances continuing, European unity on military support is increasingly important. However, countries like Hungary, which oppose continued support for Ukraine, could complicate consensus within the EU. Ukrainian officials, including Foreign Minister Andriy Sibiga, have made it clear that they will not make concessions to Russia, insisting that peace cannot come through appeasement. Sibiga also expressed hope that changes in U.S. leadership might create opportunities to accelerate peace efforts, noting that contacts had already been made with Trump's team following a congratulatory call from Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. Additionally, Ukraine announced it would file complaints with the United Nations and the International Committee of the Red Cross, ICRC, after a video allegedly showed Russian troops executing a wounded Ukrainian soldier, which Kyiv argues violates international law. Russia is becoming increasingly aggressive on British soil, according to Admiral Sir Tony Radikin, the chief of the British Defense Staff. While the global rules-based order is under strain due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Sir Tony highlighted that the UK itself is now facing rising threats. He pointed to incidents such as the 2018 chemical attack on British soil, and more recently, Russia's interference in the UK's airspace, waters, energy infrastructure, and digital systems. These concerns were echoed by MI5 Director General Ken McCallum, who warned of Cold War-style espionage by Russian intelligence agencies targeting UK businesses and government secrets. McCallum emphasized that Russian efforts are intended to destabilize the UK's security and economy, including state-sponsored sabotage and attempts to create chaos on British streets. Despite these threats, Sir Tony expressed confidence in the UK's defense, citing its nuclear status, NATO's collective strength, economic power, and the capabilities of the UK's military forces. However, he cautioned that the current era of competition and geopolitical contest could be more disruptive than any challenges Britain has faced in modern times. Addressing these threats, Sir Tony stressed the need for Britain to leverage its military, industrial, technological, and scientific strengths, as well as its allies. Additionally, Sir Tony reflected on the sobering experience of visiting Ukrainian recruits training in the UK, underscoring the personal sacrifices of ordinary people fighting to defend their country against Russian aggression. UK Defence Secretary John Healy also acknowledged the growing insecurity in Europe, stating that it is a heavy responsibility to send British forces into potentially dangerous situations to address Putin's war in Ukraine. Russia has expressed openness to hearing President-elect Donald Trump's proposals for ending the war in Ukraine, according to Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Ryabkov. He stated that Moscow and Washington are exchanging signals on Ukraine through closed channels, although it was unclear whether the communication was with the current U.S. administration or Trump's incoming team. Ryabkov emphasized that Russia would be receptive to proposals focused on finding a resolution rather than continuing the flow of military aid to Kyiv. In Kyiv, Ukrainian Foreign Minister Andriy Sibiha expressed Ukraine's willingness to cooperate with Trump's administration, noting that President Volodymyr Zelensky was one of the first world leaders to congratulate Trump after his election. Sabiha mentioned that communication between the two sides has already started and that Ukraine is ready for further cooperation, hoping for a just peace. Meanwhile, EU foreign policy chief Josep Borrell reiterated the European Union's unwavering support for Ukraine, stressing the need for faster deliveries of weapons to aid in the defense against Russian aggression. Borrell also urged Western allies to lift restrictions on Ukraine's use of long-range weapons to strike Russian military targets. In Odessa, a Russian drone attack killed one person and wounded 13, damaging residential buildings, private homes, and warehouses. 
Ukrainian forces shot down 32 additional drones, and a Russian aerial bomb struck a highway in Kharkiv province without causing casualties. Ukrainian officials continue to call for more Western support to counter Russia's escalating aerial campaign amid growing uncertainty over the future of U.S. aid under the new administration. Trump has consistently criticized U.S. support for Ukraine, praised Russian President Vladimir Putin, and made vague promises to end the war. A significant drone strike targeted Moscow and its suburbs overnight, causing injuries and temporarily halting traffic at some of Russia's busiest airports. Moscow's mayor, Sergei Sobyanin, reported that 32 drones were downed around the city, with one woman in her 50s suffering burns after drones caused a blaze southeast of Moscow. Although no casualties were reported in Moscow itself, there were reports of drone debris igniting fires in suburban homes. Russia's aviation authority grounded flights briefly at major international airports, including Sheremetyevo and Domodedovo. Meanwhile, UK Defense Chief Tony Radikin highlighted the heavy toll Russia's military has suffered in Ukraine, describing October as their worst month of casualties since the invasion began in February 2022. He stated that Russian forces are losing an average of 1,500 soldiers daily, bringing total casualties to around 700,000. Radikin pointed out that these losses are being incurred for minimal territorial gains, especially as Russia's offensive in Ukraine's industrial east drags on. He added that ordinary Russians are paying a significant price for the war, with mounting defense and security spending straining the country's resources. Radikin also stressed the importance of continued support for Ukraine from its Western allies insisting they should stand by Kyiv for as long as it takes to repel Russian aggression, despite signals from allies of U.S. President-elect Donald Trump suggesting Kyiv might have to make territorial concessions for peace. Both Moscow and Kyiv have been secretive about their casualty figures, despite reports of heavy losses on the Russian side due to aggressive attacks. China has published new geographic coordinates for Scarborough Shoal in the South China Sea, intensifying tensions with the Philippines over territorial claims. The shoal, which China seized from the Philippines in 2012, lies west of the Philippine island of Luzon and has been a point of contention ever since. China's move to define baselines around the shoal is part of its broader claim to nearly the entire South China Sea, which includes areas also claimed by the Philippines, Vietnam, and other Southeast Asian nations. The 2016 ruling by an international arbitration court declared most of China's claims in the South China Sea invalid, but Beijing has consistently rejected this ruling. Tensions have escalated with frequent clashes between Chinese and Philippine vessels, including incidents where the Chinese Coast Guard used water cannons against Philippine ships. The timing of China's announcement coincided with the signing of two Philippine laws by President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. that established the country's maritime claims in the disputed waters. One of these laws, the Philippine Maritime Zones Act, has been criticized by China, which asserts that it violates its sovereignty. In response, China reaffirmed its opposition to the Philippine laws, stating that it would take necessary actions to protect its territorial rights in the region which is vital for global shipping and rich in natural resources.